All right, I have got the recording started. I can hear you just fine. So I think we are good to go. Okay. Well, first off, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Uh, I really love doing these. I really love being part of this community. I really love being part of this program. So if I can do more of them, great. If I can make them interesting to you and there's a specific thing you want to cover, um, please chat with me either through this uh, or through Jenny or through email or whatever. So I would like to do more. So hopefully we can keep this going. So the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask that folks go ahead and open up their um, Jupyter Notebook environment and go ahead and open up a new uh, page. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's make sure I get the right one. Desktop two, there we go. And share. Does everybody see a screen that says up at the top S3 dash imports and tabular data? Give me a thumbs up or a green check. Yes, awesome. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay. I also so, see some pretty cool peace signs in the background. Yes, that's uh, from a wonderful, hilarious cartoon called The Amazing World of Gumball. <laughs> so um, if you all need something to ever watch with your nieces, nephews, daughters, sons, grandkids, whatever, I highly recommend it. There's some good stuff in there for all ages. All right. So we have an open notebook. We've talked about things like integers and strings. We've talked about lists and loops and things like that. And so what we're going to be talking about today is how to expand what a Python environment provides to us through what are called imports. Um, I may have mentioned in a previous meeting that um, Python is kind of like a minivan. And uh, when you go to the beach, you don't pack your minivan with everything that you would pack if you're going hiking. If you're going to pick up people for a party, you're not going to put all of this stuff in there that you would need to say, I don't know, get a bunch of lumber from Home Depot or Lowe's. You kind of, you make it the vehicle into what you need it to be when you go there. So Python's very similar. Python has a lot of built-in functionality that is fairly universal, but it also has a lot of things that are available to you that you bring in when you need them rather than having them all there all the time. And to give you an example, if I do something like five asterisk two and run this cell, it's going to be five times two. So we understand that that math operation is there as multiplication. There's also uh, subtraction, addition, division. We even have some more advanced math things. Like if we wanted to say five squared, for example, we would put two asterisks in the middle and that would be five squared, right? And so, but what we don't have are a lot of those other features that are inside, you know, kind of the, the special buttons that are outside of a normal calculator. And so the way that we get those is we import them from a, another module called math. And here's how you do it. Just type import math. And if you run this, you don't get any output. You just see that it's successfully run. There's a number next to the in. We've run the math. Uh, we've imported the math module. And now we have the things that are inside math to help us out. So if I go back and I say, five squared is 25, then if we wanted to say, take the square root of 25 and go the other way, we could go into the math module and get out the square root function. And this is the way it works. Since we've imported math, we type math, and then we put a dot. And whenever we say something dot something else, so like this, S-Q-R-T, what we're saying is whatever's on the left of the period or the dot gives us the context for whatever's on the right. So here I'm going into the math imported um, module and I'm getting the square root function. And functions usually have the parentheses. 
So if I say math square root 25 and I run this, it's going to spit out the number five. And of course, if you'll pay attention here, notice that it comes out as a decimal. And using the type command we've talked about before, this would be a float. So why is it important to put the math part in there? Well, if I just type square root and 25, it doesn't know what square root means. We haven't named square root anywhere. We haven't really said to Python, tell me, use square root. And Python says, well, yeah, yeah, what is that? Where do I, where do I look to go get it? And you say, oh, you go to the math um, uh, module to get square root. So this is helpful in the sense that if we ever have two things that are named the same thing, if we provide the context, we can understand what the meaning is going to be. It's almost like if you ask your partner to go to the store and get some oil, are you talking about motor oil? Are you talking about olive oil? Are you talking about, say, uh, the type of oil that you would put on the hinges of your door to keep them from squeaking? Without a context, it's hard to know what that word means. So you would probably have to say, hey, I'm cooking tonight, I need more olive oil. Now, you would probably also say specifically you needed olive oil, but it's good to provide that context. And there's plenty of other operations that are available inside of math. Now, I'm going to go a little into the trigonometry stuff, not because it's where we're going with today's lesson, but because it's, I want to prove a point. So we have, um, we have the trigonometric functions like um, sine, and we have, um, we can do things like, let me back up a little bit. We have some constants like pi. Now, if I had just typed pi here, it wouldn't know what pi was. So I have a math.pi to get pi out. But if I wanted to do some of the trigonometry stuff, I could do math.sine math.pi divided by six. And so this is, you know, a basic trigonometric function and if you don't remember this from math, that's cool, because that's not the point of the day. The point that I'm trying to make here is that typing math a bunch is, can be kind of, well, uh, extra work. We don't like extra work when we're programming, right? So when we import statements, we can say import math as, say, as uh, maybe int mt. Now, when I go back down here, I can say MT and MT, and it still works. So if you ever have a really, really, really long named uh, module that you're bringing in, you can shorten it so that every time you type it, instead of typing a longer name, you can type a much smaller one. And that's where we're going to start today. Today, we are talking about tabular data. Now, tabular data, when I mean that, what I mean there is it's anything that's basically in a rectangle. And we have columns and rows. If you're familiar with working with uh, Microsoft Excel, you know, we're, we understand that there's uh, columns and rows and they have, uh, the columns have letter names and the rows have number names. And then we have cells and we know that usually like a, a row has a certain meaning and a column has a certain meaning. There is a module for, uh, for Python that does many of the same things as Excel, and it's called pandas. So I'm going to port, in, import pandas, and I'm going to write as PD. Now, when you start going out on the internet and doing some research on your own for things like that, this statement is very, very, very common. In fact, I don't think you'll ever see pandas written out as pandas. It's almost always import pandas as PD. And this behaves very much the same way as our import math as MT statement works. So let's talk a little bit about how pandas works. Pandas is a module. You know, we're going to go with that whole idea of the minivan again. Pandas is 
we're going to go hiking, I guess. And this is all the stuff we're going to need to do to go hiking. And it brings in a bunch of tools for working with data in tabular formats. And one of the more famous and more um, common formats is a CSV, a comma separated values file, or sometimes it's referred to as a character separated values. The idea being is that you have data and then you have some sort of character to indicate that that chunk of data has stopped and the next one has started. We've talked about things like uh, integers and floats and strings. We've talked about booleans. We've talked about lists. There's two um, major data structures inside of pandas that we use very frequently. One is called a series, and a series is just like a single row or a single column in a spreadsheet program like Excel or Google Sheets. And it looks something like this. Remember we talked about when we have a statement with a period in the middle of it that everything to the left of the period provides the context and everything to the right is what we're doing inside of that context. And here we have a series, notice the first S is capitalized, inside of pandas and we can create a series. Now, I'm going to take a moment here to go back to something we talked about before. Remember when we talked about ranges and then we made it into a list? Remember, it starts at zero. Again, uh, these things inside of Python are zero indexed. And here we've started at zero and just put 10 values out. The range command also takes multiple values where we can change the start value. So if I said, for example, list range three comma 10, notice it starts at three and goes up to and then stops just before 10. I could make a larger one by saying 320 and then it goes all the way up to 20 and stops. If I add a third number in here, let's say, uh, let's say two, then what it's going to do is it's gonna start at three, go up by two to five, go up by two to seven, and keep on going, and then stop just before 20. If I take this same range here and copy it and put it inside of the series, it's done the same thing. See, we've got these values, but you'll notice that it has zero through eight over here on the side. And the reason for that is pandas loves to make sure that you have an index for something. Pandas always wants to make sure that if you are making a series or you're making the other thing, which we're about to talk about, that you have a way to refer to the content of each of the cells, rows, columns, and so on and so forth. So since we didn't specify an index, pandas automatically put one in. The other data structure that pandas uses is a data frame. Now a data frame is pretty much what we're accustomed to seeing when we look in something like Excel or Google Sheets. It is a series, think about a series being your rows, of series where the other series is columns. So think about making a bunch of rows with a bunch of columns. And so a data frame then is a bunch of rows and commas, co commas, a bunch of rows and columns arranged into a rectangle. Now, the easiest way to generate one of these is to go get some data and put it in. So what I'm going to recommend is if you'll go over to this page, and I'm going to share this in the chat. If you'll go to that link, there'll be a, there should be a button that says something about code. 
and you should be able to download a zip file. And if you download that zip file, it will be everything in the entire, uh, the entire repository. And the file we want to make sure we have is this one called doglicenses.csv. If you could make sure that that file, if it's inside of that zip file, ends up in the same folder where your document is today. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to make sure that I have that. And go into my document. I have downloaded that file. And CG, Python Playground. All right. And then Sorry, ULVLC, Python Playground. And so when you extract that folder, it should look just like this. And then Python Playground, there should be a doglicenses.csv file. Are people seeing this file when they download the zip folder? Yes. I see one yes. Okay. So once we have that file, make sure that it is in the same folder as the file that you're working in. I'm going to go back to my Python playground. Oops. UNCG, ELVLC, Python playground, and I have this. Um, awesome. Cool. I'm seeing some yeses. You're working on moving it to the Python folder. Awesome. So we have this dog licenses CSV folder file in our folder. So once you have that, I'm going to, we're going to read the CSV file and put it somewhere where we can get to it. Let me scroll down a little bit. And so the command for that is, believe it or not, PD, remember we're, our context is pandas, R-E-A-D underscore CSV and open parentheses. This is the command. And what we're going to put in here is a string. And the string is just going to be dot forward slash dog. Now, if I start typing do and hit tab, it should auto complete. If I run that cell, we now have our data basically where we can see it. Pandas recognizes that this is a CSV file. It has a, its first line is the column heads. And you'll notice that over on the left, it has given us an index for all of the rows. Now I'm going to pause here and say, I've deliberately picked a CSV file that is particularly clean because I didn't want to mess with all of the formatting changes and stuff like that. I just wanted to introduce the idea of manipulating comma separated value files. Now, as far as this data, where did I get this? Um, I love data.gov. Have you heard of data.gov before? It's a clearinghouse of all. Yes, Jenny loves it. Awesome. If you go over here to the organizations in catalog.data.gov and Allegheny County and then Allegheny County dog licenses, this is a list of dog licenses that people have applied for <laughs> over the years. And what's nice is their CSV format. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this link and put it into chat. Because what's nice, it's nice to be able to work with data. For those of you who worked with my uh, pivot tables class, that was a um, data set that I created that was fictitious, but this is real data and we can start doing things with it. And I think that's a little bit more fascinating. So we've got this data. We see that it's got seven columns, right? Seven columns with data in it. And we've got 32,000 rows. What was the command to pull the CSV? Right. So it's pd dot read, R-E-A-D, underscore CSV. I'll just go ahead and type it again. pd, R-E-A-D, pd dot R-E-A-D, underscore CSV. 
And then I'm gonna do an open parentheses, which in this will automatically put a closed parentheses. I'm gonna put a quote, which automatically puts its pair and puts the cursor in between. Dot forward slash, and I'm gonna type, type D, O, and hit tab. And it's gonna go through and try and find things in that folder called that begin with DO and it auto completes. And when I run this, I get this data here. Now, what I'm going to do now is like we've done before, I'm going to assign this to a variable. So we're talking about dogs. So this is going to be doggos equals PD read CSV dog licenses. And I'm going to run it. So you can see that doggos here didn't really give me any information. Um, let me scroll this bad boy out just a little bit so it's easy to see. Can everybody read this all right? I hope this is a good enough size for visibility. All right, it's pretty small. Okay, I'll zoom in a little bit. Is that, is that better? Does that make it a little bit easier to see? Okay, all right. I might be able to do one more. There we go. Okay, so we've got our data in this doggos variable. And so let's see what doggos is. It is a pandas data frame. And if we look at doggos again, here it shows us the first five rows and the last five rows. So we get an idea of what we're looking at. And I'm sure in the past, you've probably opened very, very large spreadsheets and then scrolling through all of that. It's tedious. You don't really get a lot out of it. And so what Pandas tries to do is it tries to simplify things so that it's less impact on the computer, but also not give you more information than you need unless you specifically ask for it. So some of the things we can do with the doggos variable, we're seeing the first five and the last five, but what if I want to see more? Well, I can say I would like to pull from the head of the file, meaning the top of the file, by just saying doggos. Remember, doggos is the context, and I want to say head. And by default, it will just give me the first five rows. But what if I want, say, the first 15. Well, if I just put 15 as an integer inside of the parentheses and run it, then I can see the first 15 rows. I can also do things like, what if I wanted to look at the last seven? These are the last seven entries. So the head is the top and the tail is the bottom or the end. We have, oh, Patrick, just you wait, just you wait. We are going to, yeah, you have no idea what we're about to do, but you, I don't know. I feel like you're reading my diary, Patrick, because you're asking a lot of questions that are le very, very, very leading. All right, so yes. So we do have names. We have, we have the, yes, I, I'm, and I'm, that's, I'm, I'm inspired by doggos. I have doggos and um, I'm going to say doggos quite a bit. So see what people are missing out by not being here today? Doggos. Okay. So we have the license type. We have the breed. We have the color. We have a dog name, the zip, the year that it expires and when the date, um, the valid date. And so you'll see that the date is in a particular format here. So what if I wanted to just look at a particular column or a particular row? If I wanted to, I can go here with our doggos and I can say color. Now what I've done is I've put a bracket, a square bracket after the word doggos, and I've put a string inside of the quotes of color. Notice that it's case sensitive. Both of them have a capital C. And if I run that, I'm getting the same thing as before, where I'm getting the first five and the last five, but I'm getting just the colors. Now notice how the type changed. 
when I do doggos, and it looks like this, but when I do doggos just a particular column, it looks a little different. The reason why is doggos with just a column is called a series. Now remember we talked about series. Series is just a single row or a single column of values. And so what we can start doing is we can start taking our data frame and slicing it up into various smaller data frames or series and performing operations on those. If we pass, for example, a list here, so we've got breed. Let's do dog name and breed. If I inside, inside of these brackets put another set of square brackets and type dog name, oops, capital N, comma, breed. Remember this? From one of our lessons before, this is a list. This is uh, square brackets. And inside of the square brackets are things that are separated by commas. So I am going to give doggos a list of columns. And when I look at it, it's just going to be the dog names and breeds. And notice that the list in the order that I gave it is the order it gave it back, even though breed and dog name are in switched position down here. And you're probably looking at this as like, yeah, this is great. Why, why would I care? I mean, maybe I care about what 32,197 dog names are with breeds and things like that. But is there anything more that I could do? Well, yes, there is. So if we're looking at a data frame and we wanted to say we could look at, I don't know, the 34th one, oops, sorry, wrong one, wrong thing. If I wanted to say, I wanted to look at doggos and I wanted to look at dogs that were a, that met a certain criteria. Well, we're probably familiar with the filtering options in Excel, right? Where you either sort by a certain value and you see which ones are at the top or you use the filter, which you can then say, there'll be a little click down menu right here next to dog name and you could drop down and you could check the box that says Millie, for example, and it would return all of them that were Millie. In pandas, it's a little different. So if I wanted to know, say for example, all of the dogs that were named Millie, I'm gonna use that same brackets uh, notation that I used before. I'm going to put a double equals and it's case sensitive, so M I L I E, and I'm going to run this. And when I do, you see, we're getting a bunch of trues and falses. And what I've done here is I've created something called a mask. And so what it has done is it's basically created a series of true and false values. And it's going to say, if the dog name is Millie, put true, otherwise put false. Now this doesn't really give us much, right? We're just getting a list of Booleans. Remember Booleans from the first lesson? We're just getting trues and falses. Well, what we can then do is we can take that mask and put it in brackets with the original data frame and it will generate the data frame we want to see. So I'm gonna highlight this text and put brackets around it and type doggos again. So what I'm saying here to doggos is I want you to everywhere there is a false, ignore it. But everywhere there is a true, give me that row. And when I run that, here are all of the dogs who are named Millie. And you can see that the index jumps all, it goes all over the place. Oh yeah. <laughs> so we have wonderful, you know, ways to filter things out by looking at, 
this. Now we don't have to do dog name. We could do breed equals, what do you say, golden doodle? We got Bexley and Bailey and Isaac and Riggs and Isabel and Jasper and Yogi and Parker and Hazel. We have 769 golden doodles, right? Now, what if we wanted to do two things? So for those of you who are familiar with Boolean operators, when we do searches, we know the difference between or and and right? If I wanted to see all of the golden doodles who were also blonde, then what I would do here, I'd put parentheses around this to keep it to itself, right? And then I put an ampersand, another, and this time I'm just going to copy because I'm, guess what, lazy. And I'm going to say color equals, what did we say? Blonde. There we go. Here are all of our blonde. All, let's see. Looks like we've got a few of them. We've got Chewy. We've got Harley. We've got Polo, Avery, Charlie, Divi, Dalai, Dalai Lama, mm, Einstein. Ooh. Do we have, did I see another Bailey? Oh my goodness. So anyway, we can do Boolean searches. I'm gonna make this just a little smaller for the sake of showing this here by putting a first uh, query here inside of parentheses and then a second one inside of a second set of parentheses. Now the parentheses are important because of the way that Python evaluates the ampersand. If I had left the parentheses out, it would just look at golden doodle and doggo's color because of the spaces. So the parentheses help the groups happen in the right order. I can do or with a pipe, which is the vertical line just under, just above the enter or return key. And this is everything that is either a golden doodle or is blonde. This will also include blonde go golden doodles but you can see that there's a blonde golden retriever, a blonde German shepherd, so on and so forth. So we've started figuring out how to filter down stuff. How do we look at say values and things? So we go back to doggos and I want to know, I think Patrick was asking about names, right? Capital D-O-G, capital N-A-M-E. And I'm going to go U-N-I-Q-U-E. This generates a list, or in this case, an array, very similar to a list, of all of the unique names within here. Now, because I have created what is an object here, I can now do things with it. Anywhere that you see one of these objects that's a series or a data frame, a lot of times your what the output is is also a series or a data frame. And since it is too, you can do more operations to it. So what if I did sort values? Oops, sorry. That's not the right thing. This is sorting them. Now these last ones have some extra characters and we're not gonna worry about that. But we can start sorting the values in such a way like alphabetical. Here's where we're gonna start getting kind of crazy, I think. So Patrick asked the question, how do we count how many of each of the names are, there are, right? Well, we can do something that uh, is called grouping. Now remember in, if you took my uh, pivot tables uh, UVLC class, yeah, it is, it is a weird name. There's some weird names in here, definitely. Um, 
and I'll show you how to get them out in just a second. Um, if you recall, if you didn't take that class or if you need a refresher, when we group things, we can group by a shared characteristic. We grouped by color, we grouped by shape, we grouped by count. In this one, I can do go uh, doggos group by, and I'm just gonna put dog name here. Now that will group them, but it doesn't, we haven't done anything yet. We have not chosen what to group them and then what single value are we using to represent that group. And so what I'm going to do is represent by size. So we've got Chiba, there's two of them, there's one, there's, you're right, it is a very weird dog name and it wasn't duplicated that year. But there is one Elwood Merino, there's one Lily, there's two Louis spelled like this lowercase, because lowercase and uppercase are gonna be treated different. But there's 7,952 different names. And we're only seeing the first five and stuff like that. So now what I'm going to do is sort values. Looks like Bella is the most common name registered in this particular year. 440 Bellas, 313 Lucy's. 279 Mollies, 276 daily, Daisies, 272 Baileys. Okay. This is again stuff we're doing that is probably very familiar to you if you've used Microsoft Excel. We can say in here instead ascending equals false and this will put the higher numbers towards the top. So it basically reverse the order. And what if I do head 10? Here are the top 10 names with counts for this particular year. Out of the 32,000 that we've gotten, we've taken our doggos data frame that we got from that CSV. We're grouping it by dog name. And then we're choosing to say the size of that collection. This is another way of saying how many are there. And then we're taking that list and we're sorting it by saying ascending equals false. We're putting the larger numbers at the top, so it's descending, and we're getting the top 10 of them. So I've probably not sold you on how cool this is just yet, because to me, the really important thing is what you can do in this that makes it okay you you had a dog named max and a dog named maggie classic names yeah so it looks like you're you're quite supported here in your uh <laughs> in your uh dog name choice as being popular so for me what i think the benefit really is here is how can we do some automation with this so what i'm going to do is I am going to say, instead, we're going to look at the, say, the top 20, right? And when we do this, I want to just show you real quick that, again, this is a series. So a lot of what we're doing is we're taking data frames and creating other data frames, creating other uh, series, we're creating other um, data frames from series and so forth. By the way, if you have an iPhone and you say, okay, series, yes, she did. That was exactly what it was. <laughs> yes, that is exactly what happened. And that has happened to me before. I should have put my phone in the other room. <laughs> All right, so since we have a series, even though, we, even though it's this long string of stuff, we have a series. And remember, a series has an index right? This is our index. Yeah. Yeah. Like you'd say Alexa. And I bet it's tough for you with Alyssa and Alexa that some people might get that confused if people are over at your house. All right. So I have an index with a bunch of values in it. 
Remember our for loop before? Remember our for loops? We talked about those. I'm going to say, oh, fortunately, you did not have an Alexa. Yeah. I, talk to Michael Reeder about how his kids and what they do with it. Yeah, that's some fun. Um, I'm going to create a new, uh, new list, a new variable here. I'm just going to call it pop names. Okay. So what I've done is I've taken doggos, grouped it by dog name, got a count for each of them, sorted it, put the largest ones at the top, and took the top 20, and took those, the index values. If we scroll back and look, remember this right here, the zero through eight was the index, and these are the values inside of the series. Well, down here, the index was the dog names. So now, what I'm going to do is for dog name in pop names, colon. Here is how we uh, talk about our for loops. Remember we had our for loops before where what we're doing is we take a group of things in some sort of order and we take one out, we do something with it, we set it aside. We go in and we get another one, we do some with it, we put it aside and we keep doing that. We keep iterating through these items until we're done. So what am I going to do with these dog names? Well, if I print them, it just prints the name, the text of the names. And while that's, you know, interesting in a sense that it's done this for us, I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to say doggos, that's our data frame where doggos dog name equals dog name. Remember up here when we were doing these masks, we did a mask with golden doodle, right? Now what if I do dog name equals and what was the biggest one, Bella? This is 440. Remember, we've seen that number before, right? When we looked at uh, the, this part, I'm gonna copy this and just show it again. See, there's 440 here, there's 440 for Bella. If I put Lucy here, 313, 313. So where you're seeing that our, yeah, <laughs> still a lot of Twilight Bounds out there, I guess. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised, what was, what was the, yeah, is that, was that the, was that the, the baby's name? Yes, okay, all right. I'm pretending that I didn't know that. Okay, um, right, yeah. Keep laughing, it's okay. <laughs> so what are we doing here? We're, we're taking this data frame of doggos and we're saying, I want you to first j go through and grab all of the Bellas and make a single data frame. Then I want you to grab all the Lucy's and make a single data frame. Then I want you to grab all of the Molly's and create a data frame. Are we seeing what I'm thinking here? I'm going through each of these and I'm creating separate data frames. So for each dog name and pop names, doggos, we're creating a mask using that dog name. And then we're going to use the opposite of read CSV. We're going to create a file by going to CSV. Now, in order to go to CSV, I need to provide a name. So it's the same thing as before. I'm going to do a string, but I can do this, dog name dot CSV. And if I put the F out front, it knows to turn whatever's in the curly braces into the dog name. So what's going to happen here? I'm going to start at the first one in pop names. I'm going to pull it out of pop names. I want to grab all of the doggos who are named Bella. 
in the doggo's dog frame and I'm going to create a CSV called Bella.csv. Then I'm gonna go get Lucy, do the same thing. Then get Molly, do the same thing. Get Daisy, do the same thing. And if I run this, did you see how fast that ran? Now go, let's go look at that folder. Let's go over here to the what were we talking about? We were talking about Bella. I'm going to open this with Microsoft Excel. And what we've done is we have taken a CSV file and we have filtered it and we have automatically generated a bunch of CSV files based upon search criteria in there. Now, does it have to be dog names? No, it could be dog breeds, it could be dog um, colors, it can be, you could even sort by the val valid date. So let's expand out here. Is this stuff that you could do in Excel? Sure, but did you see how fast it went? And that's, that's the point here is that, um, if I'm gonna do this, let's send these all to the trash, and I'm going to say, 50 here and run that, run that. I now have 50 CSV files uh, filtered by name for each of these. If we go down here and we look at Zoe, open with Microsoft Excel. This is Bella. Come on. And here is Zoe. So in a matter of what have we done here, this, we're now at about the uh, 50 minute mark for this hour. We've walked through how to take a CSV file, we bring it in, we grouped by dog name to get counts, we sorted it, right? in such a way that we're getting the most popular ones at the top. And then we're using a for loop to filter them out into their own CSV files. Now to me, I think that's kind of a win because there's been plenty of times when I have needed to go into a, an Excel file or something like that. And then I sort where I have I sort them by something other than I copy and paste the top, top 20 and then I copy and paste the next 50 rows and then the next 20 rows and stuff like that. And I save them all as different documents. But using this code here, I can in, let's see, I have one, two, three, four lines automatically filtered it and I didn't have to touch them. And that to me, that's what I'm really trying to sell here is that there are times when we do things that we have to do, but they take forever to do. So why not take the time to figure out a way to get the computer to do this stuff so that you can work on the stuff that actually requires a human to do them. And that's how we're going to end up being more productive. Anyway, that was my soapbox for here. Are there any questions? Is there anything that people would like to see here? Uh, you want you want me to do that one? Doggo's Bree, Brussels Griffin. Let's see what we got. Did you or did you already do that one? You already did. So you can see now right here. What if we had said like group by breed? We could do the same thing here. Now we can see like um, we got a bunch of retrievers, bunch of mixed here. But the same thing here. Group by um, breed, uh, pop breed, and I'm just going to do 10 here. And then remember the multiple cursors, you know, where you can, if you click in two places and use the command or control key, you can do that. And then I'm going to say, this is going to be breed. And then I'm going to say dog breed and we said we're gonna do 10 of them right let's see if this works 
go back over here and look. We've got, did it refresh? Oh, I might need to do, uh, there's spaces in them and that causes problems. Oh, okay, parentheses versus square brackets. Very good question. Um, Alyssa asked that question and that's a very important one. When we, uh, typically parentheses indicates that you're doing something. There's some sort of operation. There's some sort of command you are running. So when you're doing say PD, uh, PD read CSV in their parentheses, read CSV is a function or a method you might hear it referred to. And inside of those parentheses is where you put things called arguments. And arguments basically change how the input is going to come into the command or function or method, depending on what it's called. Now, in the case of data frames, like doggos is, let's do this way. When I put the brackets here, the square brackets are telling me I want to basically return only a part of doggos. Um, and sometimes what I'm doing is I just want to return the breed column. And so I'm taking the doggos data frame and I only want the breed part. Now you'll probably remember up here, I put some more square brackets inside of here. And this is where it's a little confusing and I admit that. What I'm doing is this set of square brackets is a list. Remember, um, let me do it this way. That's a list. I could say um, two things equals that. And then I could say, And so I've made it a little more complicated here, but the point that I'm trying to make is that the first set of square brackets next to a data frame or a series is saying, I want you to just take a piece of this and here's how I want you to break it up. And it just so happens that I'm using a list to provide a list of column headers. Does that help? Cool. All right. We're at the three minutes remaining mark. And I'm going to invite you to ask more questions or if there's things that you want to see, please let me know. Um, let me, I'm going to do something because I think what's making this one not work is because there's a space here. How do I use this regularly? Um, so one of the things that I do with this regularly is anytime that I have a data set, um, for example, one of the things that we've been doing is we've been looking at usage stats in um, easy proxy. So when people go and they go get something from JSTOR, they go and get something from uh, EBSCOhost or something like that, and it goes through our proxy, we see when they went, and what they got. We don't see who, who got there. We, we keep all that stuff anonymous. But what we can do there is we can see things like, I can use this uh, group by to see which uh, hosts are being seen the most. I can see things like, if I started breaking it up by hour of the day, I could see our most popular times of day are this. If I break it up by day, I can say, this is what this set of days looked like in 2019, and this is what it looked like in 2020. You know, for example, uh, now that we're all working from home and people are using online resources more, it's, it makes sense that we saw a big jump in our stats from last year to this year about what was being used um, online. There's a bunch of other things that I haven't quite touched on here that are, because um, right now we're looking like, for example, breed, but we didn't ever talk about you know, what if it contains the word um, shepherd and how to do that? I'll just really quickly. Um, th 
this is this is a way that you can specifically look for the word shepherd, but not where it's all these other things have just been looking specifically for the entirety of that text. And so when you want to start looking for pieces of text that use information and, uh, you know, is the presence or absence of a particular word in a particular string, you know, that kind of stuff. You're very welcome. Well, we're at two o'clock here and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Again, thank you so very much for doing this um, with me here. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate taking the time to learn with folks. Uh, every time y'all ask questions or y'all think of things, it helps me learn too. And I think there's nothing greater than learning. And I feel like that is at least partially shared by everyone in the library because we work in a library. So thank you very much. And I look forward to doing more of these in the future. Thank you so much, Brown, and thanks to everyone for participating. I am going to go ahead. Oh, no. Oh, no, Patrick. <laughs> Joe, I was just asking for trouble. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.